So the book that we're talking about today looks at observation practices of celestial nebulae in the 19th century, and it pays special attention to the relationship between the act of seeing and the act of recording what was seen. How did you come to focus on this particular topic for the book, and how did you come to decide to construct a book-length object about this topic? Well, in order to answer that, I have to go back again to my dissertation, which was published uh, as my first book um, called Bertrand Russell and the Edwardian Philosophers. And in that, the, the story is about the history of construction in mathematics and in psychology. And in working through that history of construction, um, broadly construed, um, I kept bumping into William Herschel's work on constructing the heavens from the late 18th century. And this was a vast project uh, on uh, on the nebula. And this really uh, got me really curious and interested, but I couldn't pursue that. After my PhD, I had the opportunity, uh, splendid opportunity actually, to work at the Max Planck for the History of Science in Berlin as a part of a project called Knowledge in the Making. And the entire premise of this very, very dynamic project was to shift the focus of historians of science to the mundane instruments, in, particularly mundane instruments like the pencil and paper. And um, for someone who is interested in the history of construction, generally speaking, as I am, um, there is a form of constructing that involves pencil and, pencil and paper. And I thought this was a great opportunity to begin exploring this form of constructing uh, using pencil and paper, using the case of the nebula, which William Herschel uh, began studying and what he called the con- constructing the heavens. So is it nebula? I keep pronouncing it nebula. I just started studying, <laughs> and so I see the A E. Yeah. I think, oh, it's uh, it must be pronounced like nebula. <laughs> yeah, you probably it probably are right, but I've I've pronounced it nebula for a long time. So <laughs> let's let's say nebula. That's I'm I'm happy sure. to go okay. with you. <laughs> okay. I'm learning something new every day. <laughs> and and big shout out to the Max Planck Institute as well. I'm heading there in two weeks. Uh, okay. It's been a couple months. It's a wonderful, wonderful place to work on it the is. history of science. So as you've mentioned. Um, the focus of the book really situates it within a growing field of history of science scholarship that's devoted to making and constructing of knowledge, but specifically the making of knowledge that relates to paperwork, paper tools, and paper instrumentality. So we learn a whole lot about forms of paper, graphite pencils, and their centrality to the instrumentality of the history of science, among other things in the book. Now, why focus on nebulae? Um, Why did this emerge for you and for the people you're working on as such a crucial and such an important kind of object um, through which to manifest the concerns you're interested in? Well, uh, the object of the nebulae um, happened to be uh, and happened to become a very central concern for the people of the project that I was involved with, which was called Knowledge in the Making. And uh, one of the reasons for that was basically because the 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 object of the nebula uh, helped to bring out many of the salient features of the instrumentality of the pencil and paper. Um, the nebula were uh, very, very mysterious. Uh, they were riddled with a lot of questions and puzzlement. Uh, and for most of the 19th century, which was the century in which they began to be studied. And, um, and the way in which the astronomers began to uh, approach these mysteries, these nebulae, um, and the way in which they strategized in, uh, how, and rationalized their approach to these nebulae really uh, can be seen and uh, clearly seen uh, in their paperwork and in their notebooks. Uh, The strategies that they use were pencil strategies and paper strategies, the way they ordered their books, the way they ordered their paper, but also the way they ordered their note-taking and their sketch-making. And this was done uh, very consciously by these astronomers uh, as a strategy uh, uh, as, uh, as a strategy to approach the mysterious uh, nature of these of these nebulae, which were 
which were in many ways wholly new to uh, to science and to astronomers at the time. And uh, this then links us to another very important point, and that is um, the paper and pencil are generally speaking, not just to astronomy, but more generally to science, are central to the observational sciences. And uh, astronomy, for most of the history of science, has been the observational science par excellence. And to understand how this observational science uh, approached one of the most difficult objects in its career uh, reveals a lot about what the nature of observation is vis-a-vis pencil and paper. Mm -hmm. Now, you talk about the kinds of images that are in these notebooks, the images that you're focusing on, specifically as working images. And this is one of the many methodological concepts that you introduce throughout the book that help us understand not just this particular case study, but also the interplay between observing and drawing, making and knowing more generally. So can you talk a little bit about these images as working images? Um, what, what is important for us to understand about that particular methodological contribution for us to understand the work that the book is doing more generally? Right. So um, one of the ways to approach um, what I've called the working image is to first begin by understanding how historians and sociologists of science up to today have actually understood and explored and examined the visual in science. And it has been primarily by way of the end product. Um, So, Usually when you pick up a work by a historian or sociologist, a sociologist of science who deals with the visual, it's the, it's the end product that really is the matter, uh, subject matter of examination. Um, this is then very easily connected with, with an assumption that's uh, usually made not by these same historians of science or sociologists of science, but an assumption that's very easy, easily sneaked in to the material. And that is... Observation is a one-time snapshot um, practice. Uh, basically, you you draw or you note something, and it, you have it, it then put into publication. And there you go; you have the end product. Uh, what the working image does is is that it helps us to um, dismantle these views. Um, first, it helps us to provide a language and a methodological tool to begin understanding not the end product per se, but how we get to the end product. That is, the many layered processes that are involved in the production of the end product. And this, these processes involve within themselves not only numbers and descriptions, but a whole regime of different sorts of images that work their way up in this process or what I call procedure, to an end product. And these uh, these images within this process, in this pre-publication process, in these preliminary tentative process, actually behave in very peculiar ways, in ways that end products or published products, visual products, do not behave. So one way to bring that out is to compare it to Le- Bruno Latour's notion of immutable mobile, um, immutable mobiles work as a notion splendidly with end products. Um, but when you begin to look at working images within the pre-publication process, what you find is that these working images um, are have their agency and power precisely due to the fact that they are mutable and not immutable. Um, And this mutability is exploited by the astronomers vis-a-vis the processes, which include um, uh, many, many, many drawings, many, many numbers, and many descriptions within an array of notebooks. And... um, and, se- and then finally, uh, the working, the notion of the working image then also helps us to see that uh, observation is never a one-time snapshot of the world, that working images um, actually can behave so that um, uh, one object may be studied over and over and over again over many years uh, thanks to 
um, these these working images. Uh, so uh, one object may have many working images attached to it before it's ever established that uh, by the astronomer or the scientist that the, this uh, that these images now must be or this one image now must be published. So it actually breaks up observation into a much longer process, a much more complicated and complex process. And the notion of working image helps us to uh, understand the nature of the image within this pre-publication process. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Now, as we move into the further chapters of the book, we move into a prologue that considers not just working images as uh, working images of objects, but also published images of the objects as they become objects themselves. So um, for many of these objects, the published images turned into proxies for the objects themselves, which is a really interesting part of this process. Now this comes up in a discussion of the work of one of the foundational figures in this study and a figure about whose work we um, need to think about uh, or we need to think, we need to understand in order to understand what's to come. This is Sir William Herschel. Now you introduce him in the prologue as a way of providing um, a basis and a foundation of what's to come. So could you do a little bit of that work for us here? Um, Who is he and what do we need to understand about his work on nebulae in order for us to understand um, the work that you're doing later on um, with these later figures and later chapters? Right. So um, William Herschel is extremely important for this story um, because it's thanks to him that the research into the nebulae really gets off the ground. Um, people before uh, William Herschel did notice the nebulae, and some even recorded a few. But William Herschel uh, really began the work by cataloging uh, 2,500 of these nebulae uh, over a long period of time, uh, beginning beginning in the, in the 18, 1780s and ending around the 18, uh, 1820s. And um, within this period, he, he uh, published a, a, a series of major uh, catalogs of these nebulae. And the reason he was able to do so was that for the very first time in the history of astronomy, he was able to build a telescope that was large enough and powerful enough to actually see these objects. Um, and he, he benefited from that telescope uh, and uh, uh, greatly, immensely, and as a result, so did, so did nebular research. Um, and because of his work uh, in cataloging these nebulae, he actually converted... Uh, this object, this celestial object, deep deep sky object, into a veritable scientific phenomena, um, a phenomena of research. But during his time, he was actually quite uh, ridiculed for this work because astronomy, uh, generally speaking at this time, was centered on the solar system and not so much uh, on objects beyond the solar system like the nebulae are. And uh, astronomers were much more concerned with positional astronomy. And uh, the nebulae, uh, because they're very difficult to capture with these very large telescopes, uh, most of the time uh, escaped the positional uh, uh, aspects of astronomy as well. And so because they were beyond our solar system and they weren't very easily uh, positioned, um, many thought that Herschel was doing working on things that had nothing to do with astronomy. Uh, this was then to change radically in the in the 19th century. Um, and but one of the the, the main points that uh, about William Herschel then is that he initiates uh, the the framework and the questions for subsequent uh, researchers into the nebulae. Um, And one of these questions is, for instance, whether or not there is uh, what he calls true nebulosity. That is, are these objects um, gaseous and made up of uh, another kind of material? Or are they simply clusters of many, many, many stars that from our vantage point look like a fog uh, or like a cloud? So one of the questions that he bequeathed to his 19th century, uh, um, uh, well, many of them hers, uh, kin of of his work, um, was was the question 
whether or not these nebulae could be reduced or resolved into stars, and if not, then what are they, materially and physically speaking? Wonderful. Thank you so much. And as we move into the book and into the four main body chapters, we move into this 19th century context, and we move from this foundation to look at the ways that practices of observation and drawing and their relationships actually transform really interestingly in this period. So the first chapter considers very closely the interrelation among the acts of seeing, drawing, and knowing. By drawing a natural object, as you've um, mentioned a little bit um, already, one might come to know something about it. And this is the idea behind this chapter. The chapter follows the drawing of two nebulae from beginning to end, step by step, and it focuses on the case of William Parsons, the third Earl of Ross. So Ross had two telescopes that came to be known as the monsters. So there's some really interesting characters in this story, that is to say, and they involve, you know, objects like the monsters. And you look at the astronomical observing books of Ross and his program to try to understand, again, step by step, um, how some of these drawings emerged and what the processes were. Each assistant on, uh, each of many assistants on Ross's project was assigned an observing book. And you take us through and show us how some some of the drawings of the same object with the same telescope by either different observers or even by the same observer at different times could be very, very different, which is itself really interesting. Now, but one of the Another of the really interesting things that comes out of this chapter as you take us through these steps is looking at the procedures by which the drawings in these observation books became consolidated into other formats along this, the um, sort of in the process of becoming these final images that you are taking us into. So this is the nature of my first question about this context. What kinds of procedures helped coordinate the work of these many different assistants with many different observational tendencies who were working under Ross? And um, for you, what's important for us to know about the, these procedures of coordination to understand the larger arguments that you're making uh, in this chapter? Right. So um, it, one has to realize that um, at this time, because these objects of study, that is the nebulae, are so new, so different, um, that there are no standards. There's no overall general arcing standards agreed upon by the astronomers uh, on how to approach these um these objects uh, and study these objects. And so what ends up happening is that many of the astronomers who do examine the nebulae begin to take uh, matters in their own hands and and establish a set of internal uh, pre-published procedures on how to examine uh, uh, systematically these uh, these objects. And because the Lord Ross project is very unique in that he actually employed uh, uh, many, many uh, assistants to help him observe uh, the nebula with his, yeah, the, the monster, which was the largest telescope of the whole entire 19th century, primarily dedicated to the study of the nebula. And um, one of the things that they are uh, fully aware of is the is the um, is the uh, aspect of subjectivity. Uh, um, or bringing in too much of yourself within the drawings of these nebulae. But wh one thing must be said here at this point, and that is um, the reason the book is primarily focused on drawings rather than anything else is because it just so happens that uh, the mathematics uh, and the, the numerical aspects and the descriptive aspects all were seen to be clumsy, to, to be seen to fail in the face of the nebulae. And the, the, one of the primary means of coming to grasp these unusual phenomena uh, was by making many, many, many drawings of it. Um, and and so back to the Ross project, they were uh, not unique in that regard, but they were unique in the, in the, in the sense that, they, that Lord Ross himself had hired many assistants to make these drawings of the nebulae. And the procedure that they establish is very interesting because... Um, Early on, uh, a, the procedure that they used for a good solid 20 years of work uh, with these major telescopes 
was actually modeled uh, according to bookkeeping practices. And uh, they literally used things like ledgers, and uh, they do tally up the score of their observation, individual observations later on, and record it in another book, uh, where you could then begin to see what the many assistants actually did individually, and you could see it all on one page or, uh, or on a single long page of a ledger. Mm-hmm. And so there is an account keeping, there's a tallying up um, of, of, the, of the drawings and of the information of the numbers involved from all the different assistants. And Lord Ross, on top of that, was a firm believer that, as he says in his own words, that um, the opinion... Of, of many, of the majority, is much more important to establishing an, astrom- an astronomical, fa- astronomical fact than the individual opinion. So what he, would, what he thought was that having more assistants uh, doing more of these uh, drawings and collecting more of these data would actually help to narrow down and establish the astronomical fact involved because it's more, much more of a democratic process uh, than a solitary uh, process. And this, is, this democratic process is also reflected within his bookkeeping procedure. Right. Now, one of the things you note about these ledgers is that they provide, among other things, what you call a history of familiarization in both written and visual form. And this sticks out because familiarization as a process is something that emerges very early in the book as um, one of the really important conceptual um, tools that you're using to understand this context. And so can you speak just briefly to that? What is a history of familiarization? And can you talk about familiarization as a process um, in this context? Right. Uh, In... in, um uh, bringing out this aspect of familiarization, um, uh, what I intend to do is accentuate the intimate acquaintance that's gained by an observer when he or she is uh, sitting at the telescope, or in, in some cases standing at the telescope, in the middle of the night, drawing the, uh, the object and the gestures, the posture involved, the lines, the, the trace involved, the directionality of the trace on the paper involved um, all contribute uh, to uh, an intimacy, uh, a familiarization of the object. Again, these objects are completely unknown and uh, numbers won't help in most cases, descriptions just don't help because there's very, very few words that could describe these things that they're seeing. And, but yet they're intent upon learning something about it. And I, I wish to show, and I hope I have shown, that it's actually through the gesture of drawing, through the very act of drawing, and the, and the process of drawing itself as an extended as an extended procedure, helps to gain the observer a familiarization uh, with an object. So it's an epistemic kind of a notion that connects um, in a gradual manner, in a processual manner, uh, an observer's uh, actions to his, uh, hopefully, uh, 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 his end acquaintance or knowledge of the object. Thank you so much. And as we move to the later uh, part of this chapter, I'll just kind of summarize this rather than asking you um, to talk too much about it so that we can move on to the next case. But I will mention for listeners that you show us a transformation in the procedure of the Ross group that you characterize as a a change from consolidation to coordination of multiple hands. And so this is this new set of procedures takes us into the importance of the use of topographical and land surveying techniques rather than just the kinds of natural history and bookkeeping techniques that had previously been featured uh, by the Ross group and you talk about the also the concomitant transformation from hundreds of portraits of many objects so portraits being a key term there to one descriptive map of a great nebula. And so um, people who are interested in the history of images and imaging and the nature of portraits versus maps might be particularly interested in what's going on later in this chapter as well. So as we move to the second chapter, 
we move to a study of two published images of the same object. This is the M51 nebula. This chapter focuses on the circulation and the public consumption of such images in an attempt to understand how people used these images, what was expected of the images, and how the images were employed to serve particular purposes and specific and often differing visions of the cosmos. The first part of the chapter offers a biography of the first portrait of M51 as it was used in the work of uh, John Pringle Nickel. Now, there's lots of detail about this particular um, portrait in this chapter, but what I want to ask you about is an aspect of this discussion that will then continue to be important for this chapter and beyond, and that's the importance of the spiral nature of this nebula. And so you talk about the importance of visualizing the nebula as a spiral in this chapter, and that becomes a, a point of contention and a really important aspect of the discussion here and beyond. So can you talk a little bit about that? What's going on with the spiral nature of the nebula, and what's important about that in terms of understanding the larger argument that you're making in this chapter? So um, it, would, it was actually Lord Ross who in 1845, for the very first time, identified uh, one of these nebulae to be a spiral, and the spiral uh, form had never been seen in the heavens before in such in such manner, and uh, it must have been quite surprising and shocking. Uh, but it was it ended up becoming a, a major major discovery because we today now know that these spiral what they call spiral nebulae are not nebulae at all, but rather galaxies, and that in fact our own galaxy is one of these spirals. And so the the identification of the spiral uh, by Lord Ross led him to also uh, then begin to identify many many spirals, and um, but the most important one uh, in many in many regards remained M fifty one. That was the very first one that was discovered to be a spiral. And in this chapter, I um, follow, as you say, um, the the final image, engraved image, of um, uh, uh, two of these images of M51, and I follow their reproductions in many, many different formats and in many different arenas and for many different kinds of purposes. This, by the way, helps us to to go beyond the notebooks. I thought this was an important chapter to do that because it contextualizes in a broader cultural uh, and and culture, uh, sociological uh, manner the role that these uh, final images of the nebula played. And the role they played was quite powerful. The, the, the role that they played, as I show in this chapter, uh, in, implicated religion, it implicated major debates like the one uh, surrounding the plurality of the worlds, that is, can there be life on other in other systems uh, akin or analogous to our own here on Earth, um, and the 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 final engraved uh, uh, drawings of M51 were directly brought into these very uh, kinds of debates, and uh, so I followed the the different kinds of uses of M51 uh, in these debates, and what emerges is that. Uh, M51, because of its unusual and uh, highly unique uh, character, um, is susceptible to all kinds of uh, usage by all kinds of people. Uh, I go from, as you say, John Pringle's use of the um, of M51 to show uh, an evolutionary worldview, uh, and I end with Van Gogh's um, uh, Starry Night, uh, and I, I try to show. That the that Lord Ross's two two portraits of M fifty one were reproduced uh, over the entire entirety of the nineteenth century, um, uh, and with that reproduction came an intense power of the image that was reflected in many many writings and in many uh, different ways. Great, thank you so much. And um, among the other really interesting things that are happening in this chapter, and I'll just kind of sprinkle these out there for listeners before we move on to cognition and memory and conception. Um, but you're talking about, uh, among other things, the detection of movement or attempts to detect movement in these spiral images. 
Um, actually, I'm, I'm glad you bring that up because um, uh, the, the the spiral uh, the spiral nebula is, is is a good example also of what I was referring to when I was speaking about the process of familiarization as a gesture, and um, uh, it just so happens that it's it's most likely that in in the very process of drawing a nebula as a spiral, one begins to feel its spirality. And when many, many, many uh, hundreds of new nebulae began to be identified for the first time as spirals after the discovery of M51 as a spiral, uh, I would I do claim that uh, many of these uh, nebulae were identified as spirals, not simply because they were seen as spirals, but because while during observation, they were also drawn as spirals. That is, it, the hand had a had a had a gestural, a processual feeling of a spiral to it, and this directly links up to a knowledge of the property of this uh, of this nebula. And so, the spirals themselves, generally speaking, the nebulae uh, uh, that take the form of spiral, are are a very interesting case for for what I've called the process of familiarization. That's right. And, and I'm really glad you brought up gesture and the kind of physicality of these images as well, because another thing that happens in this chapter um, that relates to this, not quite in the production of the images, but also in the experience of the images by readers and, and um, uh, consumers of the published versions, is you talk about the ways that uh, observers or sort of public users of Nichols images had to physically move and touch and kind of turn and flip the images that he published, which is also a way of kind of physically experiencing the movement. Exactly. Exactly. So there, there's, there's a, there's a, a direct, uh, well, uh, interaction with the images and they're turned upside down. Nickel directs the reader to, to do this, do that with the images, compare it to that, compare it to this. And you also later on find many others uh, basically eliciting from within the image certain responses from the reader. So they, they elicit the response of motion, of floating, of intensity, uh, of the violence and the chaos in the spiral. And these all relate to major associations in the Victorian culture. Um, spirality leading to chaos takes us back to very old ideas about, about, um, about society even. Um, and so there is many things being elicited by, uh, from the viewer of these images by, by those who use it uh, in their books in the 19th century. And so there is, so it should be noted that you, one cannot see uh, these spirals moving in the telescope. And one of the great challenges of the 19th century was to identify movement in the spiral. Um, and one of the reasons that they wanted to identify movement in the spiral is because they, f- they felt that there should be movement in such a form. That is, spirality uh, indicated simply by its form some sort of movement. And so um, this is really, uh, this becomes a major, major theme. Great. And the importance of movement um, and of motion is something that we'll also come back to when we come to a later chapter as well. This one, just as much as this offers us, I think, a history of familiarization, the book also offers us, among many other things, kind of histories of movement as they shape and are shaped by um, these image practices in, a, I think, a really interesting way. So listeners also um, who want to, who are particularly interested in the connection, connections between and the kind of breaking up of the dichotomies between art and science might find um, particularly interesting conversations about that in this chapter. And I'll also direct listeners um, to read this chapter if they love the Starry Night, because you can't, um, after reading this chapter, you can't look at Van Gogh's The Starry Night in the same way and see it in the same way as you did before, um, which is really a kind of a beautiful um, way of seeing that you're giving us as readers um, as well. So thank you for that. That's just completely transformed the way I look at that painting. So chapter three, as we move um, further into the book, compares how another Herschel, right? This is a different Herschel, John Herschel. And That's right. right and E.P. Mason are in different ways relating paper to the mind, to thinking, and to memory, to cognition. So you start with a discussion of E.P. Mason. 
Now, one of the really interesting things about his practice for drawing nebulae is that he is sort of working with drawing and visioning practices that explicitly incorporate memory as one of his tools. So his method both kind of, a, again, explicitly identifies memory as a tool and helps us think about what's happening cognitively in the practices um, of drawing and observing as you're treating them in the book. So can you maybe start us off in our exploration of cognition and mind in this chapter by talking a little bit about the importance of memory here and how that's um, being manipulated and shaping E.P. Mason's work? Right, so uh, E.P. Mason was um, really important um, because he he was very conscious of some of the issues involved in standardizing uh, the ways astronomers approach these objects. And in specific, he wanted to provide a much more standard way of, uh, a standard procedure of drawing and depicting these, these nebulae. And he... One of his main contributions was the uh, was the use of the ISO line or the contour line to uh, help him in his uh, depiction of the nebulae. And one of the main uh, reasons he um, he uh, wants to include a contour line, and this is something that doesn't really come up in other in in the literature on the contour line, is uh, which he makes explicit is that. In, in having um, uh, the piece of paper readied with certain kinds of contour lines, one can go back to it uh, with a certain kind of memory. And because there is this, there's this gap between looking through the telescope and then looking uh, away from it to the piece of paper that you have, you have in front of you, um, and in between that uh, that transition, there's always the danger of uh, being exposed to too much la- uh, light from the lamp, or uh, you you being distracted in between. That there's a there's this um, danger of losing uh, what you've seen in this gap, and so E. P. Mason uh, makes it very explicit that. Uh, having the paper readied beforehand with certain types of lines that were made to uh, in previous observations will then subsequently contribute um, to the entry of more in- visual information onto the piece of paper and actually help uh, in this in uh, overcoming this gap between looking at through the telescope and drawing on the piece of paper that is to be very specific, that is, uh, he sees the, uh, the the paperwork as actually helping with the memory of what is seen through the telescope, um, and it's in the in the very action of drawing between these ready ready made uh, and ready prepared uh, pieces of paper. Um, he, he thinks that the, the link between seeing through the telescope and drawing uh, can be safeguarded. Uh, and so basically he's externalizing a kind of memory uh, and a kind of aid to memory upon the piece of paper uh, for him to help him then to subsequently enter more in visual information onto the piece of paper. And so he, he is fully, uh, and this is really interesting, uh, that he's fully aware of the problem and then he uses paperwork and lines and uh, preparation of the paper to help him overcome issues of of uh, of, uh, of observation and, in particular, a kind of memory that can overcome the the distance between looking through the telescope and then drawing on a piece of paper. Thank you so much. Now, you move in this chapter from Mason's practices to look at the practices again of another Herschel. This is John Herschel. Now, Herschel, in contrast to uh, some of the observers and drawers that we've seen before, like Ross, he worked alone. And you take us into his practices um, in producing descriptive maps of nebulae, in particular in relation to his observations at the Cape of Good Hope. 
So Herschel's mode of observation is really interesting and involves several steps. Those steps include identifying a chief star, making a series of triangulations to estimate sort of class two stars after that, and then transferring what you call his working skeletons. So there's this really wonderful sort of architectural and organic metaphor here to a fresh chart. You take us into his practices as they involve measurement, calculation, and judgment. And you also take us into not just his published work, but you've also drawn on archives, his archives for this project. Now, one of the most important things, at least um, one, one of many important things in this chapter about Herschel's work that's really fascinating is that his mode of observation and drawing was highly informed by his philosophy of mind, and in particular, the importance for him of what you call conception. So can you take us into Herschel and his work by just saying a little bit about him, sort of what's important for us to understand about John Herschel, um, to understand his place in this history, and also um, what's central about his mode of conception, about this idea of conception, for us to understand how his philosophy of mind um, informed his drawing practices and observing practices. So John Herschel is, is the son of Sir William Herschel, and he basically continues on his father's work on the nebulae, um, and he takes it to an entirely different level in many ways. Uh, one of the ways he takes it to a different level is the kinds of images he produces. Um, he is an amazing draftsman in his own right. Um, he's very, very practiced uh, with the camera lucida. Um, this is a very a very specific drawing device that is used by, peop- uh, by artists to trace directly from nature. And um, and uh, on top of that all, he is uh, one of the uh, great scientists of the 19th century. In many ways, uh, some historians of science have actually regarded him as the, the uh, example case of what it means to be a scientist in the 19th century. So we're not dealing with um, um, uh, uh, an obscure uh, astronomer here. We're actually dealing with one of the... Um, prime examples of, 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 of a scientist in the 19th century. And as such, it becomes really, really interesting to delve very deeply into his archive and into his, into his procedure and the way uh, he used paper uh, and pencil in depicting the nebulae. And what he did that was quite unique, um, and he did it independently of, of Mason, um, was that he brought uh, trigonometry, triangulation, that is basically mathematics and number, to bear on the nebulae. And he did this uh, with all the handicaps that go along with these very large and lumbering telescopes that he had to work with. Um, the telescopes he had to work with not, were not precision telescopes. They were not made for precision measurement. But yet um, he actually used what he – actually it's his term, the working skeletons, to help him as aids in measurement as well. So because his telescopes were, were not uh, fitted with, uh, with, uh, with instruments for precise measurement, he used paperwork to help him overcome that handicap. And the paperwork we're talking about includes, uh, as you said, a whole series of different steps. And one of the primary steps is to produce a, a range of working skeletons for one object. And these working skeletons are produced by means of identification of of one or two major conspicuous stars in or around the nebula. And from from them, you you basically create a baseline, and then you begin to triangulate and, and thereby approximate the measured positions of all the other stars in and around the nebula, and from once you have all the stars uh, put down into a grid, that's, the grid, again, is based upon the one and two primary conspicuous stars that we began with, uh, then you begin to lay down the nebulosity itself, that is, the, 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 the cloudy features, the bright spots, the dark spots, 
and you begin to put all of that in into this measured uh, skeleton of lines and triangles and uh, and numbers. Uh, and so this piece of paper, this working skeleton, actually becomes a micrometer. That is, it becomes a, a precision tool for measurement. One that usually is attached to a telescope, but in this case is actually uh, on the piece of paper. And so Herschel takes takes the depiction of the nebulae to a new level. That is, he he includes the numerical uh, and the geometric, and um, so his procedure then is very much uh, in line and inspired by what uh, land surveyors do. And it's inspired by the, the, the huge triangulation projects that were taking place around him in the 19th century and which he, he was actually involved with in many cases. And like one triangulates uh, many, many large distances using a theodolite or different kinds of instruments uh, on the earth, in the same way he implemented a very similar type of strategy to help him provide a, uh, a scaled, well-proportioned drawing of a nebula. So this is why I uh, these these working skeletons are examples of what I've called more generally working images. So working images that come in many sorts. And these kinds of working images, that is the skeletons, actually contribute to um, a, a very unique kind of end product, a visual end product. And that is what I call a descriptive map. And the reason I stress that is because of its scaled, measured qualities combined with, in harmony with, its lush pictorial aspects. And this is in contrast to what uh, I've called the portraits, which lack the scaled proportionality and measured aspects in uh, uh, at the expense, uh, 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 well, in, in, uh, in um, uh, well, what they replace those with are, are, the, uh, are the pictorial aspects. So John Herschel, along with E.P. Mason, are, the, are among the very first to produce descriptive maps uh, of, of the nebulae. Can you say just a, a little bit about his philosophy of mind here? Because this is one of right. the um, one of the main foci of uh, your description of Herschel. What is how is his philosophy of mind shaping what's going on here? So, um, I, I should begin by saying that in this chapter, the one dedicated to uh, uh, Herschel and to Mason is the only chapter in which uh, I also believe I'm providing not only a meticulous history of science, but also a history of philosophy. And the reason I do that and, and can say that is that I, I, what I try to do is I try to extract John Herschel's philosophy of mind directly from, with, from his material process and procedure of drawing the nebulae. And the way in which he creates and constructs these working skeletons happens to nicely correspond to what he calls the constructive activity of the mind or the plastic faculty of the mind. And this notion comes up in his critique of William Hewell, a great philosopher at the time, a friend of his. And uh, he, William Hewell is an, uh, is an a priorist. And Herschel is arguing against the a priori position uh, uh, by stressing a faculty of the human mind that is responsible for the construction of phenomena and objects in the external world. And he, the, the very manner in which he constructs the descriptive maps, that is the final visual products of the nebula, Corresponds to what he describes as um, as uh, well what he describes as his philosophy of mind, the way in which the mind processually constructs its um, and empirically constructs its phenomena vis-a-vis uh, -vis a constructive activity, and so what I've done in this chapter is actually rather than imposing hopefully any kind of philosophy on the material, I've let the material itself direct us and, and guide us in understanding what we can say about Herschel's philosophy of mind. And mind you, um, 
in the literature, uh, overall, Herschel has been quite a challenge for many. Uh, many, many over the last three, four, five decades have had an inkling that John Herschel has had some serious philosophical impact and philosophical uh, interests uh, around around those uh, uh, be, being a center uh, of, of science in the Victorian period. He had an impact on others philosophically as well, not as, as well as scientifically. But it's been very difficult to identify exactly and to pin down exactly what his philosophical points of view are, except to say general things like he's an empiricist and such things. So what I've done here, I hope, is to provide one of the very first um, uh, uh, examinations uh, and identifications of his philosophy of mind vis-a-vis his work on the nebulae, which again was work that occupied him the most, more than any of his other work that he was doing as a scientist. Thank you so much, Omar. Now, as we move to the last body chapter, chapter four, there's a lot going on. We won't have time to talk about all of the things going on here, but I want to highlight just one or two of them. So chapter four focuses on the work of two observers to highlight the differences in their observational and representational techniques in producing images for an astronomical public. One of these observers is William Lasso, and you talk about the importance of his use of telescopes with an equatorial mount. So because of this special mount that was very different from the kinds of mounts that others um, were using, his instruments could actually follow astronomical objects smoothly. And the procedures <coughs> reflected the steady movement of these, inf- of these instruments. Now, what I want to ask you just a little bit about is something that you mention um, regarding this that really brings out the importance of something that we haven't talked explicitly about, but that comes up in a lot of the chapters implicitly, and that's the importance of time. Now, time becomes a really key instrument here. The the mount that Lasso was using shortened the time it took for his observational procedures, and you compare this to other procedures which were meant to extend time with an object. So can you talk about the importance of time here? Why was this important, um, and how did this shape the kinds of practices that he was using, and why is it important for your larger um, argument? Well, any strategy that uh, the astronomers used in approaching the nebulae um, had to uh, take into consideration the fact that they could not spend as much time with an object as they would like to. And this was for a variety of reasons. Many of these observers that I look at are in the Northern Hemisphere. Many of them are in England uh, or in Ireland. And as you know, the skies are not always very perfect. Um, and so just having clouds come in will reduce the time you have with an object. So the optimum thing was to have as much time as possible with an object given the constraints uh, of the instrument which didn't allow you to follow in many cases the object so well uh, when these were not equatorially mounted and given the atmospheric and the weather conditions as well not not to mention uh, the human factor that is you know one always got very tired as well um So any procedure had to take these into consideration. And so the way in which the procedure, that is the paperwork, was ordered and and arranged uh, had and was used to accommodate for this. So earlier when when equatorial amounts were not in use, that is by people like John Herschel, by people like Lord Ross and E.P. Mason, um, the the notebooks actually help to extend the time spent with an object. Uh, so not only was this time extended, protracted in the very moment of drawing it, that is, um, it was emphasized over and over again that the drawing should be done gradually and slowly, and that haste was the worst thing possible for the drawings. But it was also after the drawing. So when the drawing was then transferred to another piece piece of paper or another notebook and and then put into a different context, 
the, this arrangement and this movement of the working image that within the procedure also help the observer to spend more time with the object. And so when William Lassell, for the very first time, is able to use an equatorial mount for a very large telescope that is able to be useful for observation of the nebulae, what ends up happening is very interesting because immediately um, what is a long procedure with, with an object in John Herschel or Lord, Lord Ross becomes a very shortened procedure in Lassell. And I argue that's a direct result of the fact that he's using an equatorial amount. That is, he's a, he, that permits him, uh, this instrument permits him to spend more time in the night with an object than otherwise. And this then is reflected in his strategies within his procedure. And so when you look at his notebooks, you find that the movement of the working images are much fewer and the, the, uh, the way, uh, the route to publication is much shorter than the others. Um, and so time here is actually, even though it's shortened at the telescope, is uh, is actually short, then reflected and shortened within the procedures. Um, and time, again, is essential for the observer. Um, and for William Lassell now, what he can do is he can transfer the, the extended time from the notebook to the telescope. And this thanks to the instrumentality. And this is a nice example because it shows how the instrumentality outside of the notebook actually influences the nature of the notebook and its procedures and vice versa. That is, the nature of the procedure also then reflects the handicaps and the issues with the instruments and even things like the weather and the atmosphere. And this also, um, what you just said comes up in other aspects of your account of Lassell's work as well. Um, when you note that in contrast to previous observers who did their best to keep the presence of their instruments out of their representations, Lassell actually does the opposite. He brings um, the, the shape of the eyepiece, for example, explicitly into his images. So you have this really interesting engagement with an explicit um, invocation of the instrumentality of his procedure in his finished work in a way that's quite different from the other examples you've given us. Another thing that's quite different here is that he's producing oil paintings, um, which is also just particularly fascinating for anyone interested in the history of imaging um, and media of imaging um, who uh, might be particularly interested in that aspect of this chapter. Now, the second part of the chapter um, is also full of more fascinating accounting um, of, of uh, kinds of observations strictly because I don't want to take up too much of your time that you've generously um, given to us. I'll just kind of mention some of the interesting things that are going on there rather than asking you to talk about them. Um, the second part of the chapter looks at Ernst Wilhelm Lebrecht Temple's work. This is a German astronomer who was working in Florence, and he's also a trained lithographer. So you talk, among other things, in this last part of the chapter about the ways that his training as a lithographer really fundamentally shaped his observational techniques, and you also um, talk about his criticism of the work of Ross, Herschel, uh, Lassell, and others, in that he claimed that the spirals they were seeing in the nebulae were actually products of an intrusions of their own minds into what they were drawing, rather than features of the nebulae themselves. And so he thought spirals weren't part of the nebulae, um, they were instead imposed upon them by observers, and of course he was um, actually not, not right about that, as you show later on in the chapter, but still the, the process of um, criticism and the ways that this um, illuminate his larger understanding of uh, mind and matter and um, the, the process and the procedures of the observer are really fascinating. There's also a conclusion, which takes us into the transformation from portraits to descriptive maps, which talks about the increasing detail in the images produced of nebulae, and also relates this more broadly to issues of the philosophy of science, more so than we've um, had ch a chance to talk about here. 
So, Omar, there's a ton of material in the book, as I've probably hmm. already um, just just before um, made clear. There's a ton of material in the book that we didn't have a chance to talk about. It's a very rich study, and it's a very thoughtful study that, um, as we've mentioned briefly, contributes not just to the history of science, but also to the history of philosophy and to the philosophy of science as well. So it's doing a lot of really interesting kinds of work. Is there anything in particular that we didn't have a chance to talk about, but that you'd like to mention for listeners? Well, there's, uh, yeah, there's two things, and that is basically, um, I, I, there's always the question of photography, and uh, I do bring it up in the book, um, uh, and I try to connect it to the practices of drawing and how photography then actually is either implicated or uh, actually is um, uh, dominant within this within this, uh, this these these different procedural contexts so photography plays a role in the book and um, but not as large as 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 drawing does and that's primarily because uh, the very first photograph of a nebula didn't actually um, uh, wasn't actually taken until 1880. That's very, very late. And that's about the time where I end the book as well. Um, and second thing I really do want to mention, in, 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 uh, and that is uh, the case of Temple. That's the last character in the book. Um, what ends up happening is that he is a very important character to bring up because he helps us to see that the typical objection to drawing that we have, that is, there is too much of the mind or too much of subjectivity in it, um, that this notion itself has a history and that many of the characters that I look at in the book understand that and their their entire entire point of um, framing their procedures is to help them to minimize the effects of the mind and subjectivity in what they're doing. The difference with Temple, though, is that for the very first time, he consciously and explicitly makes the distinction between the act of drawing and the act of seeing, something that was operationally very important for the others. That is, it was very operationally important to have these two together, working in harmony. Temple divides the two. And this gives us a history of uh, the entry of this idea that drawings are subjective. Uh, Temple really articulates this point. And the others that I've looked at before Temple comes into the scene, that's Temple is basically in the 1880s, um, is that um, is that they are conscious of the effects of the mind, but they either utilize it, exploit it, or control it uh, and discipline it. And that is usually done uh, vis-a-vis the, the paper itself. So, Omar, now that the book is out, and congratulations on the book, it's quite beautiful. Um, Thank we you. haven't talked about the, the images in the book, but I will mention for listeners, maybe now's a good time to do that. Um, it is also full of really wonderful images, and these are images that do important analytic and narrative work. They're not mere illustrations. They're really a crucial part of the argument of the book. But now that the book is out, what's next for you? Are there any projects that are currently occupying and inspiring you? Well, um, the next uh, um, book will actually be a type of continuation of this study that has just been published. So uh, the book that we're talking about right now is called Observing by Hand, and the the next one will be called Observing by Light. And in that, I intend on actually providing the history of photography uh, in relationship to uh, the nebulae, so photographing the nebulae. And one of the main things about the book the, the book we're talking about today uh, is that I am very serious about the practices involved and the material involved and the techniques involved. And I want to bring the same type of rigor uh, uh, in analysis of these, of these three uh, uh, methodological uh, aspects to bear on photography itself. So I want to really get down into the very techniques of photographing the nebula. And what already emerges is a very interesting synergy uh, between photography as a medium and a multiple multiple variety of other kinds of media uh, for capturing the nebula. And so the next book will basically be about photographing the nebula. Well, best of luck on that project. I'll look forward to talking with you about that book as well when it comes out. And thanks for making the time, Omar. It's really been a pleasure. Thank you very much, Carla. You've been listening to new books in science, technology, and society. Thanks for joining us, and we'll see you again next time.